episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of our show with another truly fascinating guest who is helping to create a better tomorrow for so many people. Uh, as a little background to the show, though, especially for our international viewers, um, as many of you know, I sit here in the city of Philadelphia on the United States East Coast. And throughout the 1970s and 1980s, uh, our local baseball team, known as the Philadelphia Phillies, had an outstanding uh, relief pitcher by the name of Tug McGraw, uh, who has been long remembered for uh, pitching the final out of the 1980 World Series against the Kansas City Royals, uh, bringing Philadelphia its first championship uh, after 97 years. Uh, Tug McGraw touched the lives of thousands of adults and children uh, as a baseball player, not just from Philadelphia, but also his time on the New York Mets. Uh, and he inspired people long after his retirement from baseball. Uh, following a diagnosis of a brain tumor in 2003, uh, he began this medical journey down a, uh, a long path, searching for cures, uh, treatments for glioblastoma, uh, which sadly took his life only a short 10 months later. But even while he was battling this cancer, uh, impacted by everything he was learning, uh, he then established the Tug McGraw Foundation to enhance the quality of life uh, for kids with this disease, as well as adults diagnosed with a variety of neurologic brain conditions, uh, including brain tumors. And now foundation also includes a focus on traumatic brain injuries, post-traumatic stress disorders, as well as general uh, brain uh, wellness. Uh, throughout its fundraising, education, and collaboration, the Tug McGraw Foundation creates a, a wide range of opportunities focused on improving the lives of patients and their families. Uh, we're honored today to be joined by Jennifer Brewster, uh, who is the president and chief executive officer of the Tug McGraw Foundation, which she co-founded with Tug McGraw before his death. Uh, in her role, she's defined the foundation's mission, raising funds to enhance the quality of life of children and adults with these brain-related diseases. Uh, and her drive to better understand the brain is uh, for the love of her son, Jack, who was diagnosed with autism in 2001. Uh, in 2009, Jennifer expanded the foundation's programs to include post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injury, uh, and has a variety of very unique collaborations, uh, bringing together the best minds in civilian medicine, as well as military medicine to help uh, advance the development of new treatments and new cures. Uh, Jennifer is, uh, in addition, a board member of the Preston Robert Tisch Brain Tumor Center at Duke University, special advisor soldiers to the summit, and was married to Warren Brewster, who was uh, another famous uh, Philadelphia Phillies pitcher, uh, who was very close friends with Doug McGraw. Uh, with that introduction, Jennifer Brewster, thank you for taking the time to come on the show and talk to us for a little while. Well, thank you. That was a great introduction. I'm like, boom, you got it. <laughs> I had to go through some of that. <laughs> <laughs> that was impressive. Uh, Jennifer, I, uh, thanks so much for being here. I, I um, really like to start off like I typically do by just handing things over to you for a little bit. If you could sort of take time to introduce yourself and a little bit of your story. And if you can also, you know, just mention, go into a little bit of, of your and your husband's friendship with uh, Tuck McGraw and that family as well. Uh, that'll set the stage for a little bit of where we're going with all this. Yeah, so... <sighs> I've been doing a lot, like I said, a lot of soul searching this week and um, thinking back on our relationship with Tug and, and um, how it started. And, and long before I even arrived in the picture, it started with Warren Brewster. Um, two boys from the Napa Valley, which was Tug and, and, and Warren and um, Uncle Hank, as we call him, Tug's brother, that um, just had this community of baseball starting in Napa Valley in Vallejo. So... I, you know, when I tell our sons the stories of, you know, Tug and Warren, it's, it, the irony is when Tug got hurt in the big leagues, they called Warren up. And mm -hmm. so there was kind of always this connection between Warren and Tug. And then when I got married and became introduced to this crazy world of the 1980 Phillies, um, which I really feel um, they are a true family. Um, and um, like no other ball club that I have seen before, you know, it doesn't matter if you've been out 30, 40, 50, 60 years, you are always considered part of the Philly family. And um, they always treated me like that. And so 
Um, it was kind of this instant thing um, when we would go back with Tug and, and his family with Diane and his boys and things like that, that, you know, when it was a spring training, we were with Tug and his family. And when Tug got married, he came and got married out in the Napa Valley in which we made the, the wedding cake. So Tug was kind of always this little older dysfunctional um, brother to me. <laughs> so that's kind of how our friendship really started um, b before what I call before BT brain tumor. And um, in 2003, um, I, my background, I've had two jobs in my life, American Airlines and Tug McGraw. And um, I have no medical background. Um, I was a flight attendant for American Airlines for over 20 years um, in which I flew international and was a speaker and I did a lot of translating. Um, and in 2003, I was in Dallas and um, both Brew and um, Tug were what I would call special coaches during spring training where they go down there. And uh, I got a phone call from Tug's cousin who ironically lives just down the street from us, um, said that their Tug was in the hospital. And um, so I immediately thought I better get down there. And um, it, it was it just like the old crew, everybody in there, you know, um, on Tug's bedside, he was a community hospital and I had walked in and, um, what made me sad is I could tell something was wrong. Tug was rolling, a, I'll never forget a straw and trying to put it up his nose. And, um, I'm thinking about that, that probably doesn't sound very good. Straw nose, but you know, ball player, that, that didn't sound good. But anyway, it was because of, um, the anxiety, whatever the tumor activity was going on. He was doing very odd things with his hands. And he just says the Napa Valley tomato is here. And um, it broke my heart to know that um, we had learned that he had a brain tumor and we didn't, I really didn't know what a brain tumor really was except that I had an uncle that passed away from it when I was very young. And um, that when his oldest son, Tim came in, um, they told him that he had three weeks to live and he said it was unacceptable. And uh, that was kind of the journey of Tug's, you know, path going forward and trying to try to learn about quality of life when you've been diagnosed with a glioblastoma, which was completely foreign to everybody. And um, Tug at the time was um, in the middle of divorcing and um, it was clear that he needed support and, um, you know, in talking with it, I didn't realize that, I never realized how famous Tug was, except when he was in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. right? And when the news got out, I just had this sense to want to protect my friend because so many people were coming at him. And I also saw it as an opportunity. Um, I knew he needed help. I knew I could help the family. Um, I saw it as an oper learning opportunity to learn about my own son who was diagnosed at that time at the age of three um, with autism, just learning about the neuro. I was so fascinated. How can you just develop a glioblastoma and be given three weeks to live? And um, I had a meeting with Warren and, and my oldest son and said, you know, I really want to do this and help Tug. And, um, you know, it's three weeks. You know, I just thought, okay, three weeks. So um, through the journey, um, I, you know, Google was just going back then, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you get on and you try to find what websites and I learned very early on and I tell people today, do not Google the symptoms, right? Mm -hmm. And longevity of it. Cause nobody can tell you how long you're gonna live, right. nobody. And um, I found this doctor it was, he was treating a guy by the name of David M. Bailey, who had been out for probably 13 years, I think, at that time with a glioblastoma. And um, that doctor's cell number was on his website. <laughs> and I'm like, what idiot does this, right? And, and um, by then, we were already back. We had already left Florida, and now we were back up in Pennsylvania and and. And Tim and Faith were so gracious. They got Tug all hooked up in this condo. And I mean, it was just like they wanted to give him every opportunity. All his kids wanted to give him every opportunity to have the best way to fight this, right? 
And so I'm like, Tuck, <laughs> this doctor's number's on there. And it's still with me, 919-210, but I won't last list last four because he's still, that's still a cell number. And um, it was at Duke and um, I left a message and Tug was upstairs in his bedroom and I was down in the kitchen and this phone calls us back, this phone, this, he calls us back and he goes, I've been waiting for your phone call. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and um, I'm like, Tug, get on the phone. It's Dr. Henry Friedman from Duke. The guy that's got this guy going for 12, 13 years, right? So Tug gets on the phone and I will never forget this. To the day I live, he says, Tug, he goes, I'm going to not lie. He goes, I am the biggest jock sniffer New York Met fan there ever <laughs> is, right? And I'm like, you know, Tug, you could hear a bit of relief, right? And um, he said, um, the good news is, you know, you lost one game, but you got four more to go and I can help you. And it did not matter what that man had said. He gave Tug McGraw hope. Mm -hmm. And... I will never forget Tug coming down the kitchen. He goes, when are we leaving? And um, we got on that plane, we headed to Duke. And um, here was this man standing in jeans with a big white sweatshirt that said Duke basketball on it. And Tug says, that's my guy. And I'll never forget that. And um, we turned three weeks into over a year and it was based on quality of life and um, and it was all based around hope. We knew that um, at that time, we knew we had to chase clinical trials and talking yep. Tim and, and Mark and Carrie and um, Tug's children. We all decided that if it was never, treatments were never worse than the disease that we would proceed forward with these clinical trials. And, um, and that's what we did. And um, Tug was always very responsive to the trials and then he would fail. And um, we got the, you know, I was feeling pretty, you know, confident. I thought, you know, I was a brain surgeon by the end of this, <laughs> you know, that I could read MRIs. Yep. And um, Larry Christensen, I was getting ready to go home for Christmas because I would kind of commute back and forth. And either his sons would come in or, or his daughter or um, Elsie um, would come over and um, we'd take turns watching Tug. Um, I knew when I left for Christmas, something was up. And um, cause he started talking to the TV, which was, Tug could be, you never knew if that was Tug, right? You know, he was always, I always, when people ask me about Tug, you know, he was the little boy that played the big league game like a little leaguer in his heart. You always knew as a man what he was anticipating on the field and where he was at. And I think he was like that in life. Tug really never knew, thought he was dying or um, I think never really understood that um, the severity of the brain cancer that he had because he was just on the outside, such a happy-go-lucky guy and was an incredible ball player. And um, to his fans, I've, I've just floored at how many people just absolutely have a story about Tug. Um, it, I just had no idea the impact that he had knowing him as a Napa Valley boy and seeing him in our own family setting, but seeing him when he's in, you know, Philadelphia or, you know, New York, that was foreign to me to see how popular he was. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So I went home and, um, I got on the plane and he was talking to the TV before I left. And I thought, oh God, that can't be good. And uh, I landed in San Francisco, got a phone call. I never even went home. <laughs> that tug had been taken in. Um, and I turned around and got on the all-nighter and um, I took Jack, my son. And um, it's hard to think about this because I don't go back there. There's people, it's, it'll be 17, 17 years. But um, uh, I knew looking at the MRI that it had passed the brain barrier and it looking mm -hmm. at the Christmas tree, it was all over there. And I knew I had to call Duke and tell Henry that um, I said, I'm not the one that's going to tell him. And um, I called his kids and um, Tim flew from Nashville out within hours. And, um, and Tug, um, 
you know, the family was so gracious to them. They wanted to give him, where do you, I mean, I'll never forget, you know, the family asked him, what do you want to do, Tug, you know? And we'll take you anywhere in the world. I mean, it was like, make a wish for Tug right there. What would you like? And I'm like, oh crap, he's going to want to go to Ireland, but he's really not Irish, right? <laughs> you know? And I'm thinking, okay, I got an autistic kid. Would I have my passport with me? And what does Tug say? He, he, he wants to go to Nashville. Mm. And um, it was a, it was a beautiful thing. And, um, you know, we said all our goodbyes there and all his teammates and I'll never forget. It was Rusty Staub that I think it was what resonated with him when Rusty called him because he'd be taking phone calls throughout the week and between football. And I was always in trouble for interrupting football. I didn't realize how important it was. And I'd be doing crosswords and asking questions. Um, but when Rusty Staub called, I knew the light went off with Tug. Whatever Rusty said to him, it resonated with him like, I'm not gonna get out of this, am I? And um, it was that moment. And um, it was probably the most beautiful moment that I saw a man feel complete about his life. Mm -hmm. And Tug, I learned, like I said, I, I, I knew Tug, the ball player. I knew Tug, the Napa Valley family guy. I didn't know how, how it was hard for Tug not to be Tug McGraw. Mm -hmm. And I think that he, in the end, really, I felt, felt comfortable in his own skin about um, not having to go out there and be Tug at times. Mm -hmm. And um, in the end, I really felt that he had peace with himself and his family. And... Um, and I think the most beautiful part was um, when the family was coming in and out, um, he waited for his son, Mark, to get there and Mark placed a baseball in his hand and he left us then, you know, mm. and, and I think really Tug really tried to be that dad to so many people in the end. So he was a beautiful man. Um, yeah. Yeah. With some great quotes, <laughs> you know, I was thinking about that today, how, um, you know, we all know him for the you gotta believe and for the yep. astroturf and, you know, kids ought to be signing more, you know, practicing autographs. But um, I think the one that resonates me that, um, that people don't know him as well for is that I have no trouble with the 12 inches between my elbow and my, my, my palm. It's the seven inches between my ears that are bent mm -hmm. and how much the brain, <laughs> you yep. know has played a part of his legacy and um, his persona and personality. So that's my story of Tug. And um, he took a flight attendant, if you ask me, 18, 19 years ago <laughs> on my great Hawaii layovers. Um, if this is what I would be doing, um, I would have said, heck no, mm -hmm. you know, but it, it was life changing for me and um, Tug McGraw was a very unique mentor to me in a different way. A very special person and a very touching story uh, at that. And, and you know, to add into that, the the fact that as he was going through all this, he came up with the you know he came up with this idea that look, I have, even though this is taking me and, and breaking me down, I have to set up this foundation for others because it's got, it's hard for me as a celebrity that uh, has means that for everybody else that uh, you know. They, they need even more. So it says something about him that uh, even thought to set this up. Um, and, and there's even a funny story about that. So, <laughs> you know, I, Tug sometimes I didn't think was as deep as some of his thoughts because like Tug would just say things that were so profound. And I'm like, did you just realize what you just said, right? So <laughs> as we were all sitting around discussing what Tug, I said, you got to create a legacy. And even if you outlive it, we'll all laugh about it, right? So that was kind of, we always wore pink fuzzy slippers and our rule was that we're not going to talk about cancer unless we have to hurdle it right but mm -hmm. right now you've got a clean slate right so in discussing what he was going to do and this is how tug was i mean looking back at him he was so charitable in everything that he did in philadelphia and in new york i mean because what's that thing that jack has and i said 
autism? <laughs> I said, you are not the face of autism. You know? <laughs> he wasn't even thinking of himself like, you know, and then the second one was, you know, what's that thing that Tim and Faith do? Literacy? I said, you're not the face of literacy either, <laughs> right? So we ended up calling Duke and spoke to he Dr. Henry Friedman, his doctor, and he mm -hmm. says, what you guys have been doing has been quality of life. Yep. You have been managing the tea leaves. And that's kind of how we, I looked at him as a career, you know, his baseball, he's a mid-relief pitcher, right? And everything that we were doing was, what can we do to get to a cure? How do we get to home base? We've got to keep rounding the bases, but until we get to home, and that was eating, that was exercising, that was anything that we can create that would detoxify any of the weapons that were coming at him to, yep. you know, kill the tumor. And we realized if we can improve sleep, if we can reduce anxiety, if we can help with short-term memory, because I was doing post-it stickers all over him, um, that we had an, a chance to keep advancing along with clinical trials to just keep him at that bell to get him there. And we realized that was quality of life. And that's what Henry said, you've been doing this all along. Yep. And um, I think we took our three week sentence, you know, to over a year because what was unique about Tug is that he never really got sick, sick no matter how much chemo or these clinical trials we threw at him, he just failed them after a while. Um, and then at the end we failed, but um, that's how we started the foundation is that we really wanted to use the non-invasive things that we were using as well as everybody gets treated like a Tug McGraw, right? And that's what we found about these institutions. It wasn't that it was Tug or that it was Tim McGraw's dad. Mm -hmm. We wanted everybody to have the access that Tug had. Right. So hence the foundation <laughs> is here. Yeah. yeah no, it's a it's it's a fabulous story, and you know, it's uh, as as I'm listening to you talk about it, you know, you you really got uh, hit from all angles in the sense that you you had to learn about one glioblastoma and obviously how deadly a cancer it is. Well, you think cancers, okay, you know, not all cancers are the same, right? There's some that we deal with to some that take people from this place, you know, this place quickly. Um, and unlike other cancers in, in this case, this is, you know, what, you know, from my previous time in the, in the pharmaceutical industry, this is what's known as a rare cancer. And this is not something like, you know, lung or prostate or what, not a lot of people get this. So you have this double whammy, it's not studied a lot. There's not a lot of people working on it and it's deadly. Um, but what you've been doing, which is so important because most people think, you know, well, the cancer therapy, it's just about, you know, as you were saying, this chemo or this new clinical trial, but it's everything else. I, I can take all these miraculous drugs, but if I don't have good nutrition and I don't sleep, and I don't have exercise, I don't have my family around me, loving me, what, there's still gonna be different outcomes. Talk a little bit, if you would, about this theme of resilience, because I think this is extremely important, not just in cancer, uh, but in other diseases, many other mental diseases, how we rebound, how we stay strong, even though a medicine might be wearing us down, we still have to keep the rest of the body healthy. Talk a little bit about this theme. Well, and I think athletes are very resilient, yeah. right? With brain. And, you know, that was one thing that I did with Tug and, um, you know, I never knew what resiliency was until I had to battle it my own self. And um, so resiliency, we define it as the capacity to basically recover quickly from a difficult situation, whether it's adversity, trauma, um, or tragedy, those yep. types of things. And in my world, um, you know, like I said, as a flight attendant and, um, you know, you're always trying to minimize risk, especially in things. Um, so I'll kind of recap how my resiliency broke and um, it happened to me two years ago. So um, I unfortunately, um, so the Tug McGraw Foundation is, is located at the Veterans Home of Yontville, which mm -hmm. is Napa Valley. Um, probably one of the oldest and largest veterans home in, in, in the country where over at the time 800 veterans lived. And it's where Tug played baseball at mm -hmm. probably Borman Field, which is a field of dreams that was built in the late 1800s. I just felt a sense of community to put the foundation there. 
and Tug would love that. And because he spent so much time there. And um, we had a terrible thing that happened. Um, we, um, Alex is looking at me. Um, we had a terrible thing that happened in which a program that we um, were a part of, but had later left um, a couple years um, afterwards, um, a shooting. Mm. And um, where three colleagues were, were killed on property that day. And I thought it was okay. And um, I came back the next day made national news, you know, every, you know, it was a little wonky for me because a lot of people knew I had previously spent a lot of time with that program. And um, I was get I got over 500 texts and within an hour of people thinking that I was no longer here on this earth because the people that had passed had the same namesake as my name is Jennifer. And um, I thought I got this and um, I was secluded in my office by myself for seven hours while the world was watching what was happening on our campus. And we looked like a war zone. We had everybody from air to land to trying to what we thought was a hostage negotiation still going on. And, um, you know, the foundation in 2009 included post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury just based on some of the anxiety things that go along with it. And people don't realize that Tug was a Marine as well for over six years. Um, when I learned that um, these colleagues had been killed um, by a bad actor, um, I froze in my office and um, I started processing my 9-11. I wasn't processing the situation that was going on there. Oh my gosh, they were killed. I was processing looking for my crew that had perished in the towers at American and the Pentagon um, in New York. And I thought, oh, that was kind of a hiccup in my mind. I thought, whoa, that was weird, right? And so obviously the shootings were a trigger for me to process 9-11, which I never did. I was a number, I was, I was, um, coming back from Paris to San Jose on that day. And we had our own trauma going in and going to Canada and learning about this and thinking that we had hijackers on our plane. So I thought I was fine with that. <laughs> I just kept going. And then, you know, 2017, I'm faced with another traumatic event. Um, next day, I go back because I thought, I mean, I thought it was going to come back to when I left that night after learning about my colleagues, I drove home and I realized we, I didn't feed the chickens. We have a brain food garden. That's a whole other story. And I thought I'd better go back the next day. My family's like, are you okay? Are you okay? And I'm like, you guys, I'm absolutely fine. You know, I come back the next day expecting to kind of see the same setup where, you know, you had the whole implosion of media and everything around you drove up to the home. There was no guard. I drove right up to my office. There was caution tape around the building from across where it had happened. And I went into a full panic attack. And um, I thought, Jennifer, keep pull, you gotta pull yourself together. I will never forget a gentleman that came up to me and he says, we have people for you to talk to. And I said, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Well, they insisted. And I remember going in and um, sitting down with this woman who had amazing hair, I remember that. And um, she says, well, she goes, you got a lot of boulders in that backpack. Let's see what you got in there. And I'm like, what? You know, always trained to, I'm okay. We don't talk about this. I'm good. Let's go. We got this. Mm -hmm. And she asked me what my boulders were, you know, and she says, when's the first time you heard of, you know, you felt pain. I said, well, my dad passed away when I was young. I never processed that. Um, having an autistic son, I never really processed that was another boulder. Um, losing a house to an earthquake, I never processed that. Um, my 9-11, and then all of a sudden, my tears just started bursting by the time I got to the incident of the shooting. And um, she said, well, that was the boulder that broke your resiliency. Mm -hmm. And I had to take a step back. And um, I'm gonna be honest, the reason why I'm at this program <laughs> where I am today, um, I was on the circuit a lot with Tug and, um, when that incident happened, I felt a fear of 
leaving my home and I became the crazy Winchester mystery lady that built this huge brain food garden, um, which was my salvation. And I told my board, I said, I, I just have to take a rest. I can't fundraise, but I am going to create partnerships and I am going to help. I wanted to help the home members that had experienced this terrible thing. And if I could build them a garden and get out there, that's the thing that saved my life in 2017. And um, my friends and family started noticing that I was isolating. I wasn't really enjoying things and um, that I wasn't at my full potential um, of what I was doing. Even though I was working like a fiend with a foundation, I found no joy in the things that I was doing for myself and for my family. And um, I decided I send all these guys to these programs, especially the military guys that are experiencing the same for me. But um, I never, and I see that very much in the health industry too, is that you've got all these doctors and nurses that tell you what to do, but yet they're not doing that for themselves, right? Um, I experienced that myself that even though I had this plethora of support coming towards me and it was the military, the community that really gave me the true support when this incident happened, that you've been here for us, we're gonna be there for you, um, is what pulled me out of my, my boots. Um, so resiliency um, is a big one that we all need to pay attention to and um, in understanding what our resiliency is. And I am proud to say that I addressed it and, um, and it's, it's, it goes along with brain wellness and it goes with the cancer, it goes with the trauma, it goes with everything that we apply. And I think that's something that we miss in teaching. We wanna give everything a pill around here. Yep. And um, a pill, that's the first thing I wanna do is give me a pill. They wanted you know, to put me on an antidepressant and I'm like, no, I need to exercise. I will be fine, you know, but that wasn't the immediate solution. So resiliency, I think is one that we need to teach in our everyday, how, how, how we do defend these difficult things when we do have adversity, trauma and tragedy and the things, those coping mechanisms to, to address them. I think um, everything you're saying, the the physical, the cognitive, the social, the, the spiritual, um, some of the things you do uh, at the veterans' home in terms of the art uh, therapy and so forth, all very important, especially with what we've been going through the last year, because uh, all of us have had our resiliency uh, tested. Um, would now be a good time to talk about where you are right now and yeah, continue this thing. To talk okay. about where I am right now. So Jack can is okay. Jack, can you go get Alex? Cause I think he's out there. My son's in the background. I apologize. Hi Jack. Can you go get Alex and can you tell him? Yeah. So he's going to go run and get him. Um, so yeah, definitely with the hands-on things that we do at the um, home and then in addition to inspiring the next generation to want to get involved mm -hmm. um, is, is I think so critical in the three pillars that we use yep. to address those issues. And so he just asked me, I just kind of told him my story on resiliency and my own personal experience. Right. Um, and like I told you, I think, when my incident happened, the biggest support that I got were from family and friends, including this guy right here, who um, I think runs, who's been begging me to come out here to this program, just based on my own need and recognize the trauma that I had gone through at the home um, to go through it. And I just kept kicking it to the curb, telling him I'm okay. But um, I want to introduce Alex Oliver, um, retired Navy SEAL from the East Coast who runs an incredible program called Virginia High Performance that addresses um, um, the challenges of um, trauma as well as bettering your body mind um, together. And I'm in week two and a half going through this to address my, my needs and it has been life changing. So I just wanna introduce Alex and maybe you can start it from here as to <clears throat> you know, 
how why these programs are important to address resilience based on your own career. Sure. Um, well, thanks for having me on here. Definitely. Uh, on here. Is it just the three of us? It's just the three of us. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> I would say performance as a whole has kind of been a, a lifelong passion of mine from uh, playing sports and stuff. And then, of course, being in the military and, and especially the SEAL teams with, you know, the, the high level of performance you have to do, not just physically, but mentally, right? Everybody, mm -hmm. you know, being anywhere in soft is a, is as much of a mental game uh, or more so than any of the other components that help you get through there. Um, <clears throat> so back in 2008, uh, me and a few buddies that were on deployment, just finished working out and uh, kind of played around with the concept of what it would take to make us just one, two, or even 3% better. And so we wrote up a kind of a point paper and it went up the chain of command and ended up making up to the, uh, uh, the chief of naval operations. And we came back from deployment and of course everybody's expecting to go on leave. And they said, Hey, not you three guys. Um, <laughs> CNO liked what you guys did and is giving you a pretty substantial budget to go figure this thing out. So <clears throat> we kind of, started doing some trips and reaching out to folks uh, from Australia and Finland to the U.S. Olympic Training Center and the NSCA and just trying to find uh, the right people to steer us in the right direction of building a true human performance program. And for us back then, it was basically uh, uh, designed around uh, the physical piece, the mental piece or cognition, problem solving, all that is one, and then uh, fuel, right? So nutrition. Um, we stay, I stayed on that program for, uh, the next seven years as a collateral duty, uh, but learned a ton. The program was very successful and ended up going, um, across, um, all, uh, special operations command or SOCOM, uh, started, uh, their own individual programs, but they all basically had to have the same foundational principles that we built ours off of. Uh, so when I got out. Um, I decided I want to kind of stay in that realm of performance. We started working with kids when we opened up Virginia High Performance in December of 14. Uh, my daughter was playing volleyball. Her team was one of the first ones we worked with. Uh, <clears throat> worked with a couple different schools around here, uh, soccer teams, volleyball, basketball, and so on. Uh, and that was going good. We were getting really good results with, with the kids. Uh, Somehow we got on the uh, National Strength Conditioning Association's radar. They came in, saw that some of the things that we were doing, liked it. Uh, and uh, at, at some point they had asked us to uh, uh, contract with them to teach a uh, tactical strength and conditioning program for them, which we do two to three times a year. Um, and that's primarily for uh, uh, military first responders uh, those kinds of uh, athletes, fast go-getters that uh, don't have an off-season like a traditional athlete would. Um, you know, they're, they're playing in their quote-unquote sport 24-7, 365. So a little bit of different kind of approach to programming and training and recovery when it comes to them. Uh, 2016, uh, we were approached by uh, two different nonprofit organizations that uh, also had heard of us and were interested if we could do something for, for veterans. Um, so we started working with some veterans in 2016 after we designed the program. Um, by 2018, we got uh, some notice from Special Operations Command. Uh, we were vetted by them and uh, since have been able to work with the active duty uh, components as well. Um, to date, we've done about 500, a little over 500 people through the program. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't really focus on the kids anymore. We're just really focused on the veterans and the active duty uh, folks that are getting banged up, trying to get them back on the battlefield. But from those original three kind of pillars of the physical, the uh, cognitive piece, and the nutrition, uh, we've just continued to add more and more pieces um, of the pie, so to speak. Uh, to increase performance across the board. And there may be things that we're looking from a measurement standpoint, like 
the DEXA scan that we use, mm-hmm. or looking at someone's blood, uh, really to help dial in as many pieces as we can because it's such an individualized program. Um, there's not a workout of the day or a week one workout. Everybody's program is designed um, off their goals and needs. Um, and it can change daily. We write the programs out daily. We know where the individual wants to be at the end of four weeks. Uh, but every day the program is written out. Mm. Uh, and for the nutrition program, uh, the dietitian writes all the meal plans, writes all the recipes, gives them gives them to the chef. The chef cooks all the meals based off that breakfast, lunch, and dinner, Monday through Friday, nutrition class for everybody on Wednesday, you fend for yourself based off what you're learning on the weekends, you fend for yourself on the weekends based off what you're learning. Uh, the speech pathologist team and the certified brain injury specialist specific to TBI um, have been uh, groundbreaking really when we start tying all these things together. We have a doctor of chiropractic um, uh, and an osteopath doctor and a physician's assistant to run the uh, uh, magnetic resonance therapies. Um, we use sensory deprivation, which has really been helpful, not only in muscle recovery, but the down regulation of the central nervous system, because so many of these guys and gals high anxiety and they can't shut the brain down. So we're trying to, again, find ways to calm that brain because all these things, when you can't hit your nutrition piece, when you can't train like you used to, when you can't down regulate, um, everything's going to affect the way you sleep. And everything, everything's affected by that. So sleep's really, uh, to, in, in my opinion, the key to everything, right? Um, so that's what we focus on. All the pieces of the pie that we have here in this program uh, really are focused at being better in order to get sleep. And then once we crack the code on sleep for that individual, it returns back into all those different pieces of pie that makes any any sense as I'm talking this out but <clears throat> everything is designed to get these uh, guys and gals sleeping again and then the rest becomes easy right but sleep really is the key in my opinion and that, that that's what we do here it's all designed for that it's a, it's, a, it's a fascinating integrated approach to to this and I, it's uh, it's really interesting seeing all the pieces you bring together and we've heard about this um, this topic re- regarding sleep. I, somebody actually termed it a couple of weeks ago, uh, sleep hygiene, uh, that, you know, sleep is becoming such, you th- think about it, but it's like, it's just, it's becoming so hard for people, especially with everything that's going on. I have trouble sleeping. I never used to, but um, I, just, I wanted to come back one. I mean, I, the connection obviously with the, the act of uh, duty, the, the veterans uh, complete sense. You, you mentioned you're doing less with the, the kids nowadays, but I was just wondering because, you know, and, Apologize, my only involvement or my only knowledge about sort of SEALs and, and so forth is me watching on the military channel BUDS training. Um, but some of these guys are kids when they do the BUDS training. And I'm just very interested, I, I know this is somewhat related, but, you know, always on that show, um, it seems like the, the trainer is always telling these kids, 90% of it's up here, you know, get your head in order. And this isn't that hard. Although <laughs> um, kids nowadays with the iPads and, you know, being in the house you know, 24 hours a day and everything that's going on in this crazy year, seems like there's got a lot of kids that need this too. Um, are you thinking of expanding the kids program at some point or getting back into that? It just uh... If we did do that, I think it would be much further down the road. Mm-hmm. Uh, we love working with the kids when we're, when we're training with them. But uh, finding this niche within the veteran community and the special operations community, uh, I would say selfishly for me, it keeps me connected to all those yep. people, um, which has been very he- healthy for me. But, <clears throat> you know, that's our niche. Got it. We, we've made huge strides there. Um, and the other piece is, is that, you know, one thing I try to share and get out there with uh, different organizations and even uh, uh, other healthcare practitioners and doctors and scientists is they've all been doing such great work, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and we've had a lot of people, a lot of these kinds of people help us out in some of the things that we do here. Sure. But 
the way I, I, I wanted this and the way I foresaw it with uh, my own issues and overcoming some things uh, through the military and transition, um, it had to be from uh, an operator's perspective. Okay. When I go to places and, and they're like, hey, this is what's wrong with you, but we can't fix it. Um, and it was on my own. I knew the things that I had been through and I knew the way my body felt better than anybody else. And, you know, I kind of was just like, as long as there's some kind of hope or opportunity, then I'm going to keep tracking it down. And, you know, thankfully, I think I get that from some of the training that I, I went through was just to, to not quit and, uh, and problem solve really. And so that's really what drove this program. It was, Hey, if I was to use a term and say that I was pretty deep in the rabbit hole mm. and, um, and kind of lost internally, well, I found my way out. Right. And I used all these different, uh, pillars in this program to, to get out of that rabbit hole. And so now I look at things and when someone comes to this program, I say, Hey, these are all the things that I went through from, uh, alcohol and divorce and, and trouble with my own, uh, child, um, and, and transitioning out the way I didn't want to, all these things were, were sucked me into a bad place, but I made it out, right? I got out. And uh, so I'm going to show all these guys and gals that come through this program, my map. And I say, here's my map. Your map's going to be different than mine, right? But I'll help walk you out of your own rabbit hole and make your map. And then as all these veterans and more and more active duty folks come through, and we help them find their map. I just tell them, I'm like, you know, you're going to have to share your map with someone someday and let them know like, Hey, this is, this is a way that I got out. Right. And you can do it too. And hopefully as everybody keeps doing that, we'll just have this huge root system of recovery of everybody, all these veterans and active duty folks showing their maps. And of course, take on what all these other scientists and doctors are, are doing and finding out. But I would say some of the things that have come out of here definitely help steer uh, some of these scientists and doctors in uh, a more direct uh, path to uh, veteran and, and active duty folks' uh, wellness and, and overall well being. Excellent. But I would yeah. like to direct the, he should be doing more for kids. I'm thinking kids' camps. <laughs> I got, I have three right over here. I'll send your way. <laughs> you know, I'm going to say that. So, and I'll use my own son, Jack, for an example. When, like, Jack, for the first five, six years of his life, all he wanted to do is eat anything that looked like a chicken McNugget. When you're autism, you very much crave, in his case, he loved the carbs and thought, you know, ketchup was, you know, a, a vegetable. But recognizing how much we learn from military medicine and, you know, what Alex was doing, it was everything that I needed to teach my kid, you know, about nutrition, about moving your body, moves the brain. And I did, I said to him, I said, oh my God, I think Jack could benefit from this. And, you know, I will say I'm grateful to the soft community because um, my kid now eats salads and he's exercising and, you know, he's learning, but I think it's also a transfer. I also think it gives you guys purpose too in seeing an, another individual with, you know, some disabilities that you sure. were training and what you learned could go on to such the greater good for other children and um you do have uh these kids respond you know to these guys and um that was one thing that i learned and um you know my kid is eating better he's sleeping better he's got more confidence and um and it is a result of this program and it is sleep I'm sleeping great and I'm eating, eating lots of different pieces of the pie. <laughs> yeah. I would say on, on the sleep thing too, just another little tidbit is the, <clears throat> the lack of sleep uh, it obviously can be caused by a lot of different things, but the biggest things we see are, are chronic pain mm -hmm. and then uh, just opioids and, and alcohol really seem to be the biggest things that take away and the anxiety, right? They just can't shut the brain down. Yep. Um, you know, so really week one in this program is designed to um, 
get a reduction in chronic pain. And then usually by the end of the week, week one, the guys are, are in less pain. Well, then they realize they don't need as many of the pain meds that they're on, whether they're muscle relaxers or painkillers, you know, and then to say, just go back and talk to the docs and let them know you want to, you know, get off some of this stuff or, or take less. And once we can do that, really then in, in week two at, at some point is where we start seeing a natural increase in sleep. I, I didn't realize, like even you do a sleep journal and, um, and that was the one thing that I, even though I'm laying in bed for eight hours, you know, I don't know how much as mine is deep light sleep versus REM. And that's something that these guys are tracking. And um, it's now I look at my sleep very, very differently and learning how to power down before you go to bed. And, um, you know, if you think about, especially in a COVID world, all these kids now have been stimulated by their iPads and you know, because they've got to do it for school. And I'm so about getting a kid's program. But, um, but I do think that, you know, you talked about sleep hygiene. This is mm -hmm. one thing that they really teach and how to, you know, start, you know, de-escalating before, you know, anything that you're doing before bedtime. So you really do get that restful. And I think that's something that we all need to be learning during these times and how much, and a guy, one of your guys just pointed out, just think we're in a car, you know, we've got the windshield that doesn't give us natural light, everything we are in a bubble. So all the things that are supposed to help us calm down to help us set us for that yes. night's sleep, we've taken away. So, um, sleep. Yeah, most of the veterans and active duty folks, and I've been <clears throat> uh, a witness to a lot of sleep studies uh, that some scientists have produced and, and helped us with. But uh, it, it, it seems, for the most part, most of these veterans and, and guys still in uh, active duty under soft average only about four hours of sleep a night. Um, maybe in bed for eight hours, but they're only sleeping about four of those. And some of that is not even good quality sleep. It's interrupted sleep or it's um, uh, forced sleep, whether it be with, uh, you know, certain drugs like Ambien or Lunesta or something like that, right? Those, those drugs will knock you out for sure, but they'll never let you get into stage three and four of sleep where all your healing hormones are, are produced, right? So, are you sleeping? Yes. So even I was bought into that years ago and I was like, Hey man, that's the only way I can sleep is to take an ambient, you know? Um, and had I known the effects of it, I probably wouldn't have been on it for 10 years. Um, so I can say now completely naturally, I don't take anything anymore. Um, I average over seven hours of sleep per night now. And that took me years to be able to get back up to that and reset my system and, and get rid of all the, you know, bumps and bruises that I had through a 21 year career, which I still have pain daily, but it, it's nothing like it used to be. Right. So <clears throat> it, it's a big uh, first step is getting that reduction in pain for the guys. But again, we're getting them sleeping. I, I think on average, what we're seeing is about a, a two hour increase in natural sleep for, uh, folks coming through the program at the end of week four is what we're seeing. Yeah, I think COVID has really put the brain on the map when you think it's the most understudied organ. It's, it's, it's insane. Absolutely. Uh, it just, and if this is confidential, then I, we don't say anything. But it, um, obviously, Virginia High Performance working with the Tug McGraw Foundation uh, on projects. Uh, is is uh, the program expanding beyond Virginia anytime soon? Franchising it? Uh, I'm, or if these are confidential stuff, we'll okay. We'll talk about some other time. Uh, we're, we're we'll do another show. Some other places, yes. Excellent. Okay. You need Hopefully, to come down here. Uh, you need to come up here. <laughs> yeah. Well. We send the Phillies this year, guarantee win to the World Series if they come through, right? Oh, nice. <laughs> Tug would have been all about this thing. He would have just had, he would have loved this place. It's pretty amazing. It's all under one bubble here. Like I wish the office is a gym and then it's got all these modalities around it, which is, it's, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's yeah, I pulled it. I pulled up the site here. It's pretty impressive looking. Yeah, it's 
Yeah. yeah. Very, very fortunate. So, and it is my responsibility to make sure that everybody sleeps. <laughs> so. Very cool. Yeah. Um, great. Um, I, I mean, it's, 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 I mean, obviously, we, we, we talked a lot about Tug and, 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 and the uh, experiences to date. Um, typically, I ask uh, this wrap up question about um, mentors, the influencers, obviously, Tug, obviously, your family, obviously, the gentleman sitting next to you, um, other people that you might want to take time to shout out to, mention. Anything else you want to plug at this point related to the foundation, to high performance, um, new things that are going to be happening? I can get the scoop one in the next couple months. Right. Yeah. West Coast VHP. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> um, no, I, you know, I, I really enjoyed the question you asked about mentors because um, that was something that I really thought about over the last couple of days. You know, you look at, you know, at, at people, who are your consultant, who are your counselors, who are your cheerleaders, you know, um, like I told you, I had two jobs in my life, American Airlines and Tug McGraw, and I have to, and looking back, um, American gave me an incredible platform um, of learning service and giving service and um, compassion, mm -hmm. and very grateful for those years of, of service with American. Um, and it was very intimidating going from just being what I called myself, just being a flight attendant, all of a sudden being at the dog and pony show to all these and you being in pharma understand, you know, how institutions play the dog and pony show, especially if they think you got a cash cow, yeah. um, you know, behind you. And um, it was very intimidating. I really felt that, you know, I could how would my voice be heard? And 17, 18 years later, being non-scientific and non-medical, I really realized I could help move the needle, especially when it came to siloing with institutions and brain tissue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think early on, some of my biggest mentors I, I, that really gave me the confidence, um, you know, aside from Dr. Henry Friedman, was probably Jean Case, um, Steve Case's wife from AOL. And I'll never forget Jean, you know, in this big board meeting when we were in New York said, I want to hear what Jennifer has to say. And it made me, I looked at them when they approached brain cancer, they approached it, they lost, um, Steve lost his brother Dan to, yeah. you know, and the way that they approached was so businesslike and so non-nonsense, even though they didn't have a medical background, it gave me the confidence that even though you have got all these brilliance, there's a part for the other sector to play. And it's the same when we walked into military, it was very intimidating um, as well. And, um, you know, some of my greatest mentors, obviously the soft community has been there for me. Um, was very early on was Mary Winnefeld and Sandy Winnefeld and um, you know really made me feel that I, I, I could help make a difference and you know those are things that are you know that I really hang on to people that have been my cheerleaders and continue to be my cheerleaders you know as you know I look at Dr. Friedman who I can make a phone call just sure. five minutes before you and I um, we're speaking. I got a call, phone call from a dear friend that helps the foundation that was just diagnosed with a brain tumor. And I still call that 919-210 number right away. So I, I think, you know, and lastly, you know, my dad always told me, don't collect stamps, collect good people. And so I will never forget that. And I'm fortunate and I'm blessed. Excellent messages. Excellent. Alex, well, have you any, anyone you want to plug to shout out to, uh, while well, we're uh, we're here, um, well, I definitely had uh, great mentors uh, growing up in the SEAL community. Sure, I won't mention any other names here, <laughs> but um, you know there was definitely a consistent uh, message throughout that entire culture, and I'm sure it's the same across SOP as a whole. But for me, it was the the constant drive and effort being instilled daily every day throughout the day to be better and to be the best you can be. And as I got older uh, in the teams and, uh, you know, started um, uh, reaching leadership positions of my own, you know, those things were always there and I kept pushing them as well. But I would say towards the end of my career, it really kind of hit me that 
what all this means, everything about all these other mentors that I had growing up in the teams about being better was, was really uh, came back to me. And are you going to leave this whole franchise, this, this culture, this community better than you found it? Mm-hmm. If you were doing everything that you could to be better every single day, then you can't not do that. It's just going to happen. And I really wish I would have, it would have clicked to me a little bit sooner with that, not saying that I didn't try hard or anything like that, but I wish I would have just thought about it that way earlier in my career, not not so much later in my career. Great messages. It's, um, it's been a great time spending it with both of you, uh, listening to these stories and, and everything that you're both doing, um, and continue to do and, uh, really great stuff. Um, for, for everybody that's going to be watching this particular episode on the YouTube channel uh, or listening uh, on the podcast, uh, you've been listening to both uh, Jennifer Brewster, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Tug McGraw Foundation, Alex Oliver, owner, founder of uh, Virginia High Performance, retired uh, Navy SEAL. Um, Alex, thank you for your service to the country. Uh, thank you for coming on the show. Jennifer, thank you for coming on the show and sharing everything you're doing. Um, and as we say to both of you, thank you for helping create a better tomorrow uh, for everybody um, and, and, and creating a brighter future. It's, uh, it's been a really special time having both of you here. Well, thank you. And thank you for the work that you do and getting all, the, all your speakers that you have are wonderful and getting the word out and what they do. I appreciate that. Thank you.